Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Well, hello, listeners. Uh, Welcome. Many of you know that we like to hear your topic requests for episodes. We have a button on our website, and many people have requested an episode on AI and dream interpretation. This is something that a lot of people are experimenting with and excited about or, or perhaps skeptical about. And so we have on today John Temple. John is the founder of the Temenos Dream App. He uh, graduated from Columbia University, where he studied history. He worked for Microsoft for about 10 years. He is the founder of A Place for Mom. He's been on the board of the Philemon Foundation, and he has read and studied Jung very widely. So we are excited to have him on and to talk about what AI can and cannot do when it comes to dream interpretation. So welcome, John. Thank you for having me. It's, It's a pleasure to be here, you guys. I've been listening to you guys for at least four years, so it's it's really mm-hmm. fun to, right. to actually be part of it. So, John, what prompted you to bring your uh, technology background to bear upon this question of dreams, recording dreams, interpreting them? What was the inspiration for that? Sure. Um, I, I had been in um, uh, Jungian analysis for a while myself, and so working with a lot of dreams and. Um, and like most people, I would write my dreams down and then I thought, oh, okay, well, let's use the phone to record my dreams. And so every night I'd record a dream or a couple of dreams. And then the next day I'd go and transcribe them on into my, like those moleskin notebooks. And I've got probably 60 of them full of dreams. And, and just coming from a tech background, I was like, this has got to be simpler. <laughs> Partly because I'm just lazy. I'm just like, I don't want to just rewrite everything again. And so the initial impetus was um, I want to make it easier to just capture the dream because I should be able to record it and then have a, you know, a computer or something transcribe it for me. And then once I've got that, I think, all right, if I get a big database of dreams, I want to know what are the symbols that keep repeating? Like what's most common, what keeps showing up? And so I want to treat it like a bit of a database and how do I kind of really look at that? Uh, And then I also have the question of, I had that dream about the bear and the black cloud, you know, like when was that? It was two years ago. I'm going through all these, which book is it in? You know, it's just so difficult. And so I figured that's, that was my primary goal. So I just, I just built it for me. I just really wanted to make my dream capture and dream work easier and more interesting. And so that's where it came from. And then the, you know, technology keeps evolving and coming forward. And it's like, oh, well, we could use this tool and let's pull that in. Oh, here's an idea. Let's pull that in. And then I started working with some friends uh, on it and they had a lot of suggestions about, well, it'd be great if it could do this. And then, hey, let's share our dreams. Let's, you know, talk back and forth with them. So can we create a platform to do that? So it just sort of grew and evolved. So it's been fun. How did that affect your analysis to be able to, let's say, type in a search term like bears, and all of a sudden you've found five bear dreams, and then you're, I don't know, bringing that into analysis and comparing them, something like that? Yeah. um, uh, I think the way it it affected my analysis and, and still does is, um, it, it's kind of a little bit of an enhancement in the sense that um, in any given analytical session, and you know, I'd go once a week for an hour, um, you could talk about maybe one dream, maybe two dreams, but anything beyond that, then you're just skimming the surface. Mm-hmm. Sure. And so you know, uh, it, it was usually, it meant that I could capture all the dreams that I have in a week, and maybe they're mm-hmm. 10, 12. And, and I can really pick from which ones 
and I'll have gone through it in great depth beforehand. And so I can kind of go in and say, I had another dream about a bear and here, and it's like that other one and so forth. And um, uh, my analyst is great. I, and I've had two over, over almost nine years. Um, uh, and, but their memory of my dreams is, you know, finite, right? Yeah. Um, but it's great to be able to go and say, and, and this one, and it kind of reminds me of that one and, and begin to kind of really pull in some things. And that kind of expands my analyst capabilities too, because mm -hmm. then they get to be able to work with um, not just that individual dream, but also see and be reminded of some other things there too. Because um, mm -hmm. they'll typically have, you know, a really good idea of who I am. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't have like an encyclopedic knowledge of every dream I've ever had. But if you can kind of combine those things, um, it, it has a nice effect. Um, and, and it gives me a chance to kind of work on things on my own. Um, I don't know, before and between sessions where I can kind of go a little bit deeper and then come to a session and be like, here's the dream and here's what happened. And, what do you think? Oh, is this like that? And is that like that? Or am I just kind of using, I you know one of the common issues with dreams is trying to take the dream material and fit it to, uh, you know, a pre-existing conscious attitude. And I'm always trying to do that. And so it's really helpful to have an analyst be like, no, 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 mm -hmm. that's, that's not the way to go. Um, but so it's fun. You you know, it seems to me like we're leaning into this idea that we we haven't actually discussed on the podcast, but I think we will at some point, is dream series. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Jung and uh, other, you know, von Franz and everything talk about how you can't really know uh, much about from a single dream. You have to watch how the images change over a series. So if you've had five bear dreams you know, what was the first one like? And what's the last one like? And you can watch the symbol, you know, which, which uh, images a psychic content. You can track psychological developments by noting the change. So I think having a way to find all of the bear dreams is really important. And uh, I, I, for that reason, I started um, keeping a, a, a digital journal for this, you know, so, so that I can sort of tech search as well. I think that that is really something important that technology brings because otherwise you're trying to index them by hand, which is incredibly yeah. laborious. Yeah. And my, my fun with that is personally, the bears used to just chase me all the time and they were scary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was always an anxiety thing. Um, uh, and over time, I could see the bear evolve to become this kind of friendly thing, yeah. very powerful, mm -hmm. still dangerous, that's great. That's but, great. but really a good kind of friend of things. And I was like, well, that's got to be good. <laughs> that's, <good. laughs> that's right. You've that's become a friendly a good bear. Direction. Right. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. That is really cool. I didn't know you actually had bear dreams. I have whale dreams. So that's, that's what I text search. That's whales. wonderful. Yeah, it is really cool. Yeah. I often have bird um, dreams. I'm talking yeah. parrots and human voices in the backyard. Oh, that's okay. awesome. Yeah. Right. The, the, the other thing that I think is interesting about what you said about series, dream series, um, one of the things that I've been coached on, um, particularly in using the word interpretation, as regards interpreting a dream, mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a more kind of a strict Jungian perspective on what that kind of really means, um, uh, and in Temenos we use it more loosely than I think a, a strict version of that is, but but the idea that um, is an interpretation accurate, you know, is, is it a good interpretation that that you've gotten? Um, particularly coming out of something like AI or, or something along those lines, that, that, that there are kind of two judges of that, or at least two. One is the individual who's sort of the ego consciousness, like, did that resonate? Did that make mm -hmm. sense? Like, did that, was that, you know, interesting? Do I, do I think, oh, yeah, that, that kind of pricked something with me? Um, but the other is the psyche sort of has its own opinion yeah. about, 
you know, well, was that interpretation right or was it not right? And so you kind of have to look at the next dream after the interpretation. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, did, did, what did the psyche think of that? Right. You know, I, I've had, I had a really funny dream once quite a while ago where um, it was, I guess, the second after, uh, after an interpretation that one of my analysts gave me. Um, and it was a dream of, and it's like the only dream I've had of my analyst. Um, uh, and he was looking for a leak and he was, you know, in a room looking down, looking for a leak on something and the leak was coming from the ceiling and it was tripping on his back and he didn't see it. Wow. We we took that to mean that that wasn't the right interpretation. That's (laughs) fantastic. Yes. Yeah. That's, um, Gus Swick calls that supervision from the self. Yeah. You know, that's like, mm, nope, didn't get that one. So, yeah, it's always really interesting as the analyst to get a dream about you because it sort of feels like the unconscious is saying, here's where you're screwing up. Right, exactly. Sometimes. Yeah. So, and yeah. He had, he had a great sense of humor about it, so it was fun. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a really wonderful example. I mean, I've certainly seen dreams, you know, where someone brings in a dream, we talk about it, the next week a dream comes back and it's either like, oh, yes, the dream maker saying, you got it. Or the next dream is like, you know, it's like the volume got turned up and it's, you know, a little, it's, and it's like, oh, I think I didn't get that. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Don, tell us a little bit more in pragmatic terms uh, exactly what the app does and what are the various functions that people could experiment with. Sure. Um, as I mentioned, the, the imp- the, the genesis of the app was to try and make it really simple to capture dreams. Um, and that's kind of, uh, that kind of goes with the whole philosophy of why we're even doing this is because we, we love working with dreams and we want to capture more dreams and we want to increase the ease with which people engage with the psyche, with their dreams, with the unconscious and all that stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, initially it's, to try and make it easy to capture a dream. So you can use Siri or Google and, and say, you know, hey, Siri, record a dream. And if you're, oops, sorry, and that just started my phone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, uh, because you, we, we have a way to set up a, a shortcut and it launches the app and it starts recording you. So you can have your phone on your nightstand. You don't even have to open your eyes. You just say, hey, Siri, record a dream. It starts recording it. You roll over, and when you're done, just hit done. That's it. It'll save it. It'll transcribe it. And then later, uh, you can kind of come back and start to work with it. And in the working with it process, it's, it, the, we've got a massive database of kind of symbolism and, um, uh, and ideas about what different symbols might mean. Um, we have ways to, you can choose your own symbols. Uh, or you can let the app kind of say, here, might, these might be the, some good symbols to look at. You can go through what each of the symbols uh, might mean and kind of ideas about each of those different things, again, to kind of prompt your engagement with like, oh, okay, this is showing up and I wonder why. And Maybe it applies to these things. Um, uh, the, you can... Um, take lots of notes, take notes about context, take notes about feelings, uh, the feeling tone, uh, take notes about uh, just anything you're thinking about the dream. Um, does the app prompt people? Pardon? Does the app prompt people specifically, you know, and now add your feelings? Or, mm-hmm. or is it just um, kind of a blank page and people no, put in it, what they think to put in? Yeah, it, it, it has different sections. So here's where you put the dream. Here's where you put your feeling context. Here's where you put okay. con, you know, uh, feeling tone. Here's context. Here are, with each symbol, here are your personal associations. So you can go through and give associations for every single symbol, just one, things along those lines. We actually haven't, we've, we've tried to be pretty loose about the process of the dream capture because we're not really sure what the right way is Mm -hmm. so so the we're looking at a way to try and step people through it uh kind of do this then do that then do that then do that but we don't want to be prescriptive 
about it. We kind of want to say, put in what you want, where you want, you know, when you want, and then we'll kind of keep it organized for you. Mm-hmm. Um, one, one of the things I wanted to emphasize is it's all encrypted as well. So, um, so no one can see your dreams in that app. If you choose to, you can also share a dream. You can share it with an individual friend. You can share it with a group of friends. You can create a dream circle and have discussions around it. Um, or you can post it publicly so that, uh, so that other people can comment on the dream and say, oh, I had a dream like that. Or I remember when a lobster fell on my head in a dream and you know, <laughs> those lines. Um, uh, so I guess that's kind of the main functions. And then we also have uh, added in AI capabilities. And the AI has brought some really kind of fun stuff for playing with dreams. Um, uh, initially, we um, hooked it up so that you can use AI to generate an image from your dream. So if I'm dreaming about bears or lobsters, I can do a little description and say, you know, draw me a picture of a bear chasing a lobster up a hill in a Miata, right? And it will create <laughs> that image, right? Um, and then I can play with it and say, no, the Miata was blue or the bear was, you know, a panda bear and, and I can kind of keep playing with it. And, and it's a sort of, you know, the, it's Jung and many others have often suggested that one of the ways to work with dreams of best ways is to get really creative and write about them, paint about them, create poems off of them, sculpt them. And this is sort of a way to do that, to kind of play in a slightly more creative way um, with the images. Um, It also has, uh, the app also has the ability to, you can ask it, go find myths and legends that might relate thematically or symbolically to my dream. And it'll go out and we prompt it to go through 32 different cultures and all the myths and legends that the AI has access to, which is not as many as I would hope, but it's pretty darn good, um, and try and look for similar themes in that sense. Um, And that can be really fun to see what pops out of that. Um, And then uh, finally, we also just have it do a straight uh, interpretation um, and to say, okay, tell me more about this dream and tell me what it might mean. And so we ask the AI to, with a lot of coaching, go through and give an interpretation of the dream, but really with a focus on asking good questions. Say, you know, if this comes up and that comes up, then there's this theme happening. May, you know, are, do you see something like this happening in your life? Is there something in a similar vein that you are anxious about or something along those lines to try and again, just engage people with more uh, kind of deeper thought and deeper engagement about the dream. So there's so much there and I I definitely (laughs) want to, no, 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 it's great. And I, I definitely want to sort of talk about obviously the AI stuff, but I'm curious the, the symbols you said it, you know, it, it, where did you get the symbol database from? What is the app pulling from? Yeah, um, there are a couple sources. One was uh, a, a an, kind of an encyclopedic source of symbolism that, uh, that I came across. That, and there are tons out there, right? There are so many books about symbolism and encyclopedias and so, of symbolism and websites and so forth. Um, anyway, I found one that I really liked and I contacted the, the author of all that and said, okay. Hey, can we license that? Uh, okay. that person said, yes, great. Absolutely. Um, but I, because they also use it in a different context, they insisted that I not identify who, who they okay. were. Okay. Um, so that was kind of part, one of our terms, but I, I, just thought, man, that person really did a good job. Okay. With that. That's okay. A good start. So that's one. And then the other is uh, increasingly we've been testing and letting uh, ChatGPT, you know, opine on symbols. And it's doing a better and better job over time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so. Okay. 
Yeah, because I mean, there, you know, to to our way of thinking, I think I'm speaking for me and Joseph when I say this, you know, there's, there are the symbol dictionaries, which we like, like Book of Symbols, or there's a whole bunch of other ones that are, uh, you can, they're linked on our website somewhere. Um, you know, and you can, you can look up bear and it'll kind of list like, here's what bear means in Celtic mythology. And here's what bear means in North Norse mythology. And here's what we know about bears and this kind of stuff versus dream symbol dictionaries, which will say when a bear chases you, it means that you're Mm -hmm. going to, you know, get in a car crash later that day or something, you know, which, which tend to be very flat flattening and spurious and right. uh, yeah so so I, I think when the symbol dictionaries are more amplifying right. yes. as you were saying and enlarging the concept that's very different than you know you drop a spoon and you're going to get a visitor in 10 minutes or something right. like that exactly yeah it's not signs it's symbols yeah exactly mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so that's the nature of your of the symbolic the, the the app is kind of raking through more of that amplification kind of stuff. Yeah, we've really tried to tune it that way. I mean, there are lots of clunkers in there, without a doubt. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but it's having gone through a lot of the stuff. I, I consider it reasonably well curated, mm-hmm. and uh, and good enough that you know it misses things and it gets confused about things and so forth. But it's almost always a little thought provoking, kind of like, yeah. oh, okay, what about that? And yeah, to your point, Joseph, it's kind of a little amplifying. And if it's that, okay. That's great. Have, have you, I love the fact that AI can hallucinate. I, I just find that unbelievably entertaining. And of course, yep. it can be wildly misleading. So I'm wondering if you've had some like hilarious <laughs> encounters <laughs> with your hallucinating wow. AI on your app. We, um, uh, and this is the, the evolution of the versions of AI is hysterical, but it's, it's definitely changing. Um, we initially started putting in, giving people the option of using AI symbolism. And we put every symbol in there with a disclaimer, like, hey, we're trying this, but sometimes it's really weird. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it, if you would put in someone's proper name, we got the most absurd <laughs> things back. Like it, like it said, this person, you know, is, is dangerous or something other. We're like, what? Like, yeah. That's just yes. madness. Um, so I remember when it first came out, I was uh, asking it to, you know, to uh, find a Jung quote, and it would just lie. Yes. It would just oh. make something up that I'd yes. never seen before. But the thing was, it sounded so credible. So that was the yeah. thing that was so disarming. Yeah, I remember Joseph. We were doing an uh, we were doing an episode on the invitation, and uh-huh. you put in like fairy tales about invitations to, to, into and it, and it, there was this great like little snippet about the frog came out of the water with an invitation in its mouth. I'm like, I don't know that fairy tale. I need to know that fairy tale. Where is that fairy tale? So I was like madly looking <laughs> for the fairy existed. tale, and I just made it up. And it was but so it was confident so about it. <laughs> I know, and I was like, I want to read that fairy tale. Exactly. So, yeah. We, we, when we in, initially introduced the, the myths and legends piece, we ran into exactly that challenge that, uh, um, uh, that, that you have a hallucination setting that you can kind of go and say, all right, do or don't hallucinate. If you're too strict, it can't find anything wow, um, because it's not too fascinating. Because, yeah, because it can't see this theme related to that theme. But if you start to kind of go a little wild, it makes up myths and fairy tales. And, oh. and so, the way ours works is we say, go out and give me eight to 10 myths and fairy tales that relate to the themes and symbols in this dream. And it goes out and it grabs them and it, and it'll come back with like a two sentence summary of each. And then you can go and say, okay, learn more, learn more, learn more. And it comes back with one initially. And I'm like, what? Like, I, I didn't think well, that's a weird one. And you click on it. You know, it says, this is the fairy tale of the frog and the princess or, you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Click on it. And, and, and it says, actually, that wasn't the fairy tale. That, I, I misspoke. It's not a Celtic fairy tale. That was from such and such. And it's just completely like, oh, no, that was wrong. And exactly. just was, yeah, and you're like, oh, man, we got to work on this setting. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but, I mean, it's a fair, it, it's, it's, that's the grain of salt, big salt, to take yeah, yeah. all the AI stuff. 
it tries to give you an answer. It always, and you can ask it a hundred times and it'll try a hundred times to give you an answer, even when it should say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the- Yeah, it reminds me of my son. He's like conversant on just about any topic and it's fascinating, but then you're like, is that true? And it's like, you realize he just <laughs> makes shit up. It's hilarious. Um, yeah. It's like he'll be a wonderful writer. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. Um, so, uh, so here's the thing. I've played around with apps for dream interpretation. I've played around some with your app, and I've also played around with the one that Kelly Bulkley has, has created. Um, uh, I've, I'm going to have to elsewhere. look up that elsewhere. Thank you. I was thinking everywhere, but it's elsewhere, the elsewhere app. And we did talk about that when we had Kelly on the show. And here is my uh, experience with AI uh, dream interpretation. It, um, I don't want to like it, obviously. Um, uh, I'm sort of innately suspicious of it. It kind of goes against some core beliefs about some very important things to me. But I will say that there have been times when I have a dream and I feed it into either your app or Kelly's app. And, and what comes back shifts the way I was thinking about it a little bit and has moved me forward in understanding it, um, which, is, which is interesting. And and I wouldn't say that that happens every time, mm-hmm. um, but but it it happens often enough that it is seems to me like it's a good um, core. You know, it's a it's a good it's a good uh, it's a good help. It doesn't. I, I think it would be a problem to lean on it too exclusively, or to take what the AI said is this is what my dream means. But it's sort of like asking someone who maybe doesn't know much about you or much about dreams, like, what would you think about this dream? And they come back with something that's a little random, but it helps you shift out of your ego perspective and maybe see it a little bit of a different direction that uh, then can lead to a deeper understanding. So I, I don't, I, I don't know if Joseph, if you've had any experience or what you think about well, it. I play around with AI a lot. So I have had a lot of experiences <laughs> and I find it all very fun. Um, my, my thinking was not so much about accuracy, but about the Temenos, which is interesting. That's your app mm-hmm. because um, when you're in an analysis that it's such a sacred closed space for a yes. period of time between the analysis and, and the analyst. And so I'm curious over time, we may know, how it changes the Temenos to introduce another voice, which is the voice of AI. And for many people psychologically, I imagine they experience it almost like a second analyst. Now, that may not be the intention, but I think for people, AI begins to become an uncanny consultant Mm. um, for them. And I don't know what the effect of that is going to be, but I am curious about it. That's a great point. Yeah. AI becomes real for people, and it sounds more and more real, like a person you're talking to. Yeah, yeah it took me a while to get over feeling guilty when Siri would say, turn left at the next light, and I'd be like, no, I'm going to turn right. And yeah, it, so I was like, oh, I'm sorry, right? I'm sorry, Siri, I'm disappointing <laughs> you. I'm going to go a different way. So yeah, I can see how that would really kind of, Take on a life of its own in your psyche. Sorry, John, you were going to say something. No, no. It, um, uh, the, the, yeah, I mean, that gets into whole, all these kind of questions of projection um, mm-hmm. and our natural tendency to start to imagine that this thing, which has a remarkable ability to create language and to speak and to appear mm-hmm. and seem like an expert in whatever you ask it, um, and to, you know, you really have to pay attention to that projection factor because it, it, it's just a machine. It, it really is not human. It's not another psyche. It's not another soul. It's just a machine. And it's, it's 
tricky to keep that in mind when you work with it. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Joseph, you've probably had this experience if you've worked with AI a lot or played with AI a lot. Um, I have played with it a ton because the only way I know how to test whether or not uh, an interpretation that the, that the, that our coached AI is coming up with is any good is with my own dreams because I can't mm -hmm. really, you know, I, sure. I don't consider myself expert in anybody else's dreams, probably not even mine really. Um, but, but that's my judgment uh, or where I take my judgment from. And the result of sending a whole lot of dreams at it, you know, time after time and getting responses, getting responses, it's positive in the sense that I really begin to recognize this is just a freaking computer. You know, this is not mm -hmm. some, like mm -hmm. my projections get dialed back because like, yeah. just dumb, you know? Um, uh, so that's helpful. But another odd thing that happens, um, we, we've been working on, um, multi-dream analysis to go and say, all right, pick, you know, go and say, here's a symbol, find all my dreams. Like I've got mm -hmm. a couple thousand dreams in the system. Find all my dreams that have this symbol and give me a multi-dream analysis across all of them. Or here are all the dreams in the last two weeks, give me kind of a multi-dream analysis there. And my opinion is at this point, it doesn't do a very good job. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's pretty, it's kind of fluffy and too general. So we haven't released that yet. Uh, but the process of sending so many dreams at an AI and then trying to, your own dreams, and then trying to evaluate its responses over and over and over um, gets really exhausting um, in, a, in, a, in a funny way. And, and I, I was talking about this with my analyst and, and he made a really good point, which was that it may well be that your psyche recognizes that this is not another soul. This mm. is not another psyche that you're talking to. And it's starting to kind of register, like, let's not do this too much. You know, like, yeah. don't, don't get too tied up in this because it, it uh, you know, it's the balancing effort of the psyche, I think. But, uh, mm -hmm. but it, was, it was a funny learning about engaging with AI a lot. So something I've been experimenting with with AI and uh, with dreams, but also with some of the transcripts from our um, episodes is, is I'll take a chat session, I'll describe what qualia are, or quail, and then I'll ask the AI to identify the qualia of a particular um, idea or establish the quail that are present in the um, transcript. And that's been very interesting, super interesting to me. Can you tell me what qualia means? It's... It's something that's um, used um, very heavily in robotics and particularly in image recognition. Oh, okay. So when you're um, asking a computer to scan, uh, let's say, uh, 4,000 images of doors, you're asking the AI to be able to understand what is universal about a door such that it could look at all these different pictures of doors and go, oh, that's a door. And what you have to teach the computer is what is the quail, which is the essential quality of doorness, which to me has something to do with archetypes. Yeah, a platonic idea. What ideas. is the universal mm. of a door mm. that you could tell a computer that then it could examine every, every image it's ever seen and tell you which one is a door? And by the way, I. Somebody told me, a NASA scientist, that when you go into CAPTCHA and you click everything that looks like this, that, or the other mm -hmm. thing, they sell that data. Oh, yeah, right. right. Because you're, you're identifying, your human brain is saying this and this and this and this, and then that's harvested uh, oh, to use God. in this image recognition research. No. Yeah, definitely. So thinking about that in terms of even dream sequences, uh, what, is the, what are the qualia of this dream? And then it'll say things like uh, sacrifice, um, uh, indignation, 
And that would be so interesting to catalog dreams based on the dominant qualia of the dream, which is, which is uh, a way of putting it together. So, uh, yeah, that's, I, I, I think there are some really interesting things that can come out of that uh, in time. I, I know, I think I mentioned this to you some years ago when we first spoke, Lisa, is uh, ultimately we may be on the cusp of something that really hasn't existed before mm. in human history, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a set of dreams of of a million dreams, a hundred thousand, right. you know, ten right. million dreams, and you know, not now, but not too distant future, the ability to look at that, you know, humanity has never had that possibility before. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. never been a time where you could have that kind of thing to look at and work on and so forth. It, it, it won't come from Temenos because ours are all encrypted. <laughs> um, but if we ask people, hey, would it be okay to look, you know, maybe someday down the road. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but that could be a very new learning just about humans. Well, so there's a couple of fanciful ideas that come to my mind when when you talk about like a huge database of dreams. First of all, I I wonder about what we would know about the state of the collective if we were able to monitor vast numbers of dreams. Like what could it would we know that dreams anticipate conscious developments. So if we had the dreams of the collective, for example, could we anticipate things that might happen in, you know, the next month? Um, I also I also wonder, I mean, I think there's such wisdom in dreams. If if we had a huge if we had access to, you know, collective dream records, would there be would there be information in there about how to solve large collective problems, for example? I mean, you know, it, it fascinates me. I, I'm a big fan of all these incredible stories about the way that dreams have led to the solution of scientific problems or the discovery of, uh, you know, new scientific principles or new, uh, new artistic ideas, you know, all the books, the paintings, the, the scientific discoveries, the inventions that had a gen their genesis in a dream are numerous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is, is some, you know, is there some thing we could know about climate change, for example, that we might be able to mine from people's dreams? So I have these rather um, uh, aspirational uh, curiosity about that. But it also takes me to the traditional ancient practice of dream sharing. And a lot of traditional cultures share dreams. They may share them ceremonially around times of uh, initiation, for example, or uh, it may just be a very common practice that, you know, members of the tribe wake up in the morning and share dreams. I mean, there's all kinds, this is documented in multiple traditional societies. And one of the things that I love about our podcast is that I, I, it seems to me that we're engaging in a kind of modern sort of dream sharing. And you're now making that available you know, by choice, people can choose to do this on the app. And one of the things that's true about um, dream sharing is when I've run dream groups or work with dreams with uh, large, larger groups of people, which is something I do every month in dream school, by the way, we have a live dream seminar that I run, um, is that y you will never get as deep an understanding of the dream if it's just one person talking about the dream. It's the multiple voices, even people that are not trained in dream interpretation saying, you know, if it were my dream, I'd be thinking about this, or this reminds me of this, or something that came up for me. Just the richness of that. And I, I think that, you know, that's enabled, you know, in your in your app too, if you care to share your dream, you could have that kind of experience. But um, well, and then there's the other side, which I want to get to too, but maybe I'll stop for a moment and just see if you if you want to respond to any of that. Something special is happening. You are invited to join us on Saturday, July 13th for a live podcast recording, Jung's American Muse, Christiana Morgan's Visions and Art. Our guest will be Christiana Morgan's granddaughter, 
the filmmaker Hilary Morgan. Hilary will share intimate memories of her grandmother, who, as a gifted and beautiful young artist, was one of the most important women to shape Jung's ideas of the feminine principle in psychology. Her visions and art illuminated the unconscious in ways he had never imagined. Together, we'll watch Hillary's extraordinary documentary, Tower of Dreams, and after our discussion, the audience can ask questions. Click the link below to purchase your ticket at the small cost of $5. We hope to see every one of you there. Sure. The, uh, uh, Amy, that's a big part of why we created the ability for people to share dreams securely. Um, interestingly, I mean, I, I'm a huge proponent of dream sharing. What I find statistically, because inside the app, we can't see anybody's dreams, but we do see, did someone share a dream? Did someone not share a dream? You know, how many, per, what percent of people in the app have ever shared a dream? And it's relatively small percentage of dreams that ever get shared inside the app. And I, I've talked to people about that. And, and it, it is, there, there, there's sort of, um, there are people who are really dedicated dream people and they're used to sharing dreams and like that and so forth. And then there are people who are just sort of wading in and kind of like, well, I've got my dreams and, and I find it really interesting and so forth, but I wouldn't ever want anybody to see anything. You know, mm -hmm. we really have to emphasize over and over and over, like, no, everything's encrypted. Don't worry. The weird dream about your school teacher being naked and whatever, like that nobody will ever see that. It's okay. Um, so people are often very, very shy yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, uh, but the ability to actually start to share and have input I agree is so valuable um, uh, from from the different perspectives that you get from the you know different um, uh, experiences of how the dream came across to someone else um, and then also you know because the nature of dreams is that it comes from our unconscious and and it's something or uh, you know, a lot of the Jungian work suggests that this is something that is coming out of your unconscious or the collective unconscious, mm -hmm. trying to find its way into consciousness, trying to kind of balance your life and adjust your life a little bit. But your consciousness is always sort of resisting it. But because of that unconscious component, it, it sort of creates natural blind spots by definition. Exactly. Because it's what you specifically are unconscious mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. and it's coming across, so it's difficult for you to see it. But your friend, it might be screamingly obvious to, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. or a few people in the dream group, it might be totally obvious to, to them, but you can't see your blind spot. So that's one of my favorite parts about the dream sharing kind of component is, is having people begin to kind of say, oh, wait, you completely missed this. And you go, oh, okay. Right. And that sense of like, um, uh, you know, that, oh, <laughs> I mean, that's you know, that sort of jolt of the new information that you were defending against, probably, that the dream maker's trying to impart to you. That, that's the sort of magic moment. Yeah. Not that we always have it, but that is, you know, sort of what I'm always trying to get when I'm working with my own dreams or, or with an, the dreams of an analysis and as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I had had a, a, a story and, and uh, a story that had come from um, my analyst who uh, heard it from uh, Hilda Kirsch, who was analyzed by Jung. Um, uh, and it would, was a story of Jung's gardener. Uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, Jung used to complain that he uh, didn't have a Jung to go to with his dreams, um, uh, you know, because he was teaching everybody about it. And he's, teach, he's taught, you know, a thousand people about dream interpretation. Um, and so uh, the, the story was that who would he go to in order to uh, kind of work on a really perplexing dream of his own? 
Um, and evidently he would periodically go and tell his dream to his gardener. And his gardener is not educated in dream work, not educated in psychology, none of those things. And he'd ask his gardener, what does this dream mean? And the gardener would say, well, I think it means this or that or the other thing. And it, it, I think Jung probably would think that, well, the, the gardener was wrong in his interpretation of it, but he was wrong in a way that was not Jung's way. It was yeah, some different perspective. And by virtue of that, it made Jung realize, oh, that's what I'm missing. It kind of elucidated some of his own blind spots. Um, in the same way that like, if you're sitting, looking at a menu, trying to decide what to order, and you've got, let's see, am I, am I going to get the hamburger or am I going to get the chicken? And you're going back and forth. And you can't quite decide. You say to the person you're with, am I, I can't decide between the hamburger and the chicken. And they say, oh, you should get the chicken. You're like, got it. I'm going to get the hamburger. Definitely. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you you know, it just like it snaps you into something. Mm -hmm. So what kind of feedback are you getting from people who are using your app? And is there a way for them to give you feedback? Yeah, um, we have uh, an, an alias called uh, feedback at temenostream.com. Um, and we're, we frequently have little prompts throughout the app. Hey, t you know, tell us what you think. Um, uh, the feedback has been pretty darn good, really. Um, uh, on the Apple Store, we have a 4.9 uh, out of 5 rating. Um, and the, the, you know, I, I really should take a lot of those reviews and put them somewhere and like show people because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, they're stunningly positive. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think the feedback we get most consistently is people like the, the insights that come out of it and the kind of prompts and, and it, that it gets them thinking about dreams in ways that, uh, um, you know, in ways that they hadn't before. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so I think in, to me, that's, if we're doing that, we're doing good. You know, that's, that's our thing. So let's talk about the dark side for a little bit. <laughs> sure. We don't want to let you off too easy. I don't know. Of course. Yeah. First of all, and Joseph, I love, you know, that you brought up sort of like, how does this voice change in analysis? But that the, the idea of the temenos is, is also, I think, relevant in the discussion of dream sharing, which is, mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I think it could be useful to stick your dream on a public platform. And of course, people do this in places like Reddit anyway, all the time now. It's like, I had this dream. What do you think? You know, and some of what might comes back could be useful in just the way you were just talking about kind of Jung's gardener. You know, it's like, maybe it's really ill-informed, but something, it shakes something loose or it makes you think about it in a new way. But there's also something to be said for having this dream, which I always think of dreams as sacred. Mm -hmm. And there's something to be said for just kind of putting it out there into the world and letting anything wash back at you, which feels um, like potentially a little chaotic. It feels a, a little bit um, uh, uh, like like something has been, um, uh, you know, not sullied, but it's been shared in a way where there is no temenos. I mean, obviously, this right. you, it could this feel manhandled. It yes. could feel misunderstood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could be confusing mm -hmm. to receive yes. input that seems overly tangential. It could also be very exciting, of course. But yeah, and then people are free then to make comments that could be both disturbing or hurtful, yeah. upsetting to somebody, yeah. um, particularly in an environment where the comments aren't curated. Mm -hmm. So there's an unpredictability yeah. in just uh, tossing one's dreams out to the relative, right. the public. That's right. Yeah. Um, it, it, on ours, um, we really try and emphasize to, you know, be kind that people, you share a dream and you don't really know what it is that you're sharing. Mm -hmm. now, yes, that's a great point. One of the most intimate things you can possibly share, like in some ways more so than like a nude or something, right? And you don't even realize what's in there necessarily. Um, so, you know, we try and kind of caution people a bit. Um, uh, and, and also we do things like, you know, ensure that people under a certain age can't 
share dreams publicly um, because we just don't want to go there at all. Uh, uh, um, so yeah, it, it's that's one of the challenging parts. Um, and you know, statistically, when I look at the people who use the app, a very small like there's a portion of people who share dreams, but there's a much smaller portion of people who share dreams publicly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think people tend to have that sense. Um, and, you know, there, there's a little bit of, um, I don't know, there, I mean, I can speculate on motivations uh, uh, of doing that. Some of it is an ask, you know, a request for input and help and so forth. Mm-hmm where people can't get anything else. Yeah. Uh, we don't curate every, or we don't um, you moderate, know, every, every, yeah. moderate every comment, but the, the system has, if anybody sees something that's off base or, or out of whack, it's got a reporting system and then we get alerted and we're like, okay, that's out. And then we'll take a look at it and, and take it down. Um, uh, but yeah, it's... Um, uh, I, it's one of those things I don't quite know what to do with. I, I, I understand people's mm-hmm. reticence about it. There are a whole bunch of people who absolutely hate the idea of sharing mm-hmm. publicly, and they've given me some serious feedback. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, to the extent that we, we've actually looked at, and we might still do it, taking the public section and putting it behind a, you have to click into the public section and say, okay, I know this is public and, and, and mm-hmm. so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but, but people want to do that. Mm-hmm. And, and I kind of feel like I'm not sure, you know, if we can give them a, f- a, a, a safe place to do it in, uh, I'm not sure I want to take that away from Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my other... Um... My other concern, obviously, is, uh, which, you know, it's the whole thing with AI. It's like, what is AI going to do eventually? And there are already companies that are basically, you know, training AI to become therapists. You know, it's like you can, the AI can administer cognitive behavioral protocols or whatever. Um, And, and of course, on a personal level, this is, you know, I'm, I'm affronted by it and, and, uh, you know, obviously, I, I have a financial stake in making sure that they don't make a good um, AI uh, Jungian analyst. But it also, I think, more deeply, it offends my sense of, um, I don't know, just just the kind of sacredness of existence. You know, so I I get that the AI is a little clunky right now, and like I said, I've I found it useful not so much in like ah. Oh, the dream, it just told me what my dream means, but more like it may be shifted. Oh, okay. I didn't think about it quite like that. Let me follow that trail. But, you know, we know that AI gets better and better and better and better. And will it someday be able to deliver, a, you know, pretty good, let's say, Jungian interpretation? And how does that damage the soul of the world to turn that function over to machines? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, um, uh, the, the, the thing I often come back to is there, there's a, a, a part of, I think it's psychology, the psychology of transference, where Jung says to, uh, to an analyst, read all the books, learn all the theories, know all the ways of working with a, with a uh, client, a patient. But then when you meet with the patient, just be one, then forget all that. Mm-hmm. Be one soul talking to another soul inside basically the temenos. Um, and that is something that the AI will never be able to do. And it, it, it I mean, we are a language generating, you know, species, like we're the word know the in the beginning there was the word like language is so critical to us and to who we are and now this thing that is so good at language um you know and is getting better and better we will engage with but it's you know it's still an intellectual way of relating and it's sort of 
leaves out the the human to human, the soul yeah. soul piece. Um, so you know, I I, I think. Like I said before, I, I think your psyche will always have a bit of a sense of that. It, and it might well be that what comes across and becomes clearer is that there is that psyche presence, soul to soul presence, that is the essence of an analytical session and working with a therapist, that it's a human to human thing. That in fact, it doesn't matter how smart the AI is. You don't get the same healing kind of equation that comes out of working with another person. Um, uh, you know, in the same way that, okay, AI can create art now. Well, okay, that's not actually going to replace artists. Like ar ar artists, like real art, uh, AI I don't think can do that. I think there's a soul kind of component of that. Well, so, I hope you're right. I hope you're yeah. right. Yeah, but I mean... I you know, yeah, here, here's, right. I, I think, I think, um, you know, uh, sort of expertise in dream interpretation, like, like many, many fields in part comes from what feels like intuition. Mm -hmm. So I hear a dream and immediately I've got a couple things and I follow mm -hmm. it and, and then I say it and the person goes, oh, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I guess that was a hit. And, and it feels a little like magic. But I, I know that, you know, Jung said that intuition is perception via the unconscious. And one of the things that the unconscious is very, very, very good at is pattern recognition. And this is why, you know, this is why uh, basically, you know, I, I think that I believe it's true that <laughs> there's pretty much no uh, chess grandmaster who will ever beat the best computer. Mm. because um you know being really really good at chess is about pattern recognition mm -hmm. and you don't know you're doing it it happens below the threshold of consciousness after a certain point in the beginning you spend time you know uh memorizing openings and memorizing end games but eventually there's just so much in here that you know that your brain is working like a little computer but it's never going to be as good as you know the the ai is getting mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, it's, I could see that it would be possible, though it feels like it would be impossible. I can see that it would be possible that eventually the AI will get so good at pattern recognition and looking at, you know, the, the, the symbols and the archetypal material and the, the, even the synchronicities and, and be able to do what, you know, it's taken people like me and Joseph decades to learn to do. Mm -hmm. And that's a little scary. Yeah, I could understand that. I, I think to some extent, the entire world is looking at that yeah, I, kind of same situation yes. coming. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and it's going to behoove us to really pay attention to how it develops and really differentiate between what is the strict pattern recognition component, which computers are just going to be better at yeah, us then yeah. and that other component that is more psyche that is more creative that is more soul side um that, that that in my opinion that's where healing comes from i i don't think that working a ton with an ai model on dream interpretation i, I i'm just not sure that that i, I think it can give you good insights and self-reflection I'm not sure that that gives you the kind of healing that a therapeutic relationship does. You know, a, a therapeutic relationship seems like it's it's about remodeling or adapting your the way you relate to another human um, in, in better ways and in you know whole ways and so forth. That I think is going to be really. Uh, it, yeah. If anything, I, it's my hope, like I said, it's my hope that it becomes clearer and clearer to us the value of the human's ability and certain human's ability to do that kind of thing. Um, but in the meantime, you know, like my perspective on it is there are, there are, you know, in the U.S., for example, there are 
by 6,000, 9,000 Jungian, trained Jungian analysts. I mean, in a population of 300 million, I mean, they're just, mm-hmm. just no, they just aren't enough. Mm-hmm. A- and, you know, my thought is I, I want to get more people engaged with yeah. dreams, with these ideas, um, with the unconscious. I, I just, you know, it, these are trade-offs. I mean, are these deals with the devil that we're talking about? You know, um, but, you know, technology to some extent is always that. Well, and and I I totally get that. And I I have the same kind of dilemma about it. And when I, you know, play with your app or, or, or the elsewhere app, I'm, I, I, you know, it is like, oh yeah, this is a way to, you know, kind of deliver some of this to more people. But, but I I just want to say the thing about deals with the devil is, you know, they, they always come back to bite you. And I, and I, you know, and this is the way our whole society relates to technology, right? Is we develop Mm -hmm. it first and then ask questions later about what the downstream effects might be. And it's like that horse is already out of the barn. So yep. for example, you know, social media, well, it's like, well, we can do this. It's sort of like, we can do this, so let's do it. And then now there's just this, you know, as far as I'm, it, it looks to me like there is overwhelming data that uh, social media is not good for the mental health of kids and teens, for example. So, so it's like, we might, we might do this because we can, and there's no breaks on it. I mean, I, you know, and, and then, and then what are, what are the possible downstream effects? I mean, and it, there's the whole, you can't put the genie back in the bottle thing. I mean, it's like, it's like, could, could we stop if we, could we, sh- if we could stop it, should we, mm-hmm. you know, I think that that's, I, I don't, I think we can't, you know, and I, I remember talking to you about it and at some point you said, yeah, but it's coming. <laughs> It's like yeah. it's coming. So, um, but but it, but it seems to me that it's important to to even just entertain. Like, if we could stop this, should we? And I don't know that. I don't know that I. I don't know that I know how I feel about that. I think I feel kind of complicated about that. Yeah, I mean, Joseph, I'll bet you've watched um, uh, the AI dilemma, mm-hmm. which is put together by the same guys who did the social dilemma. Um, Aza Raskin and uh, Tristan Harris, yeah. mm-hmm. really, really, really good, good stuff, but really scary, really, really concerning uh, about what's coming and how it's changing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it, it absolutely scares me as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but I, I, I kind of can think. All right, I just want to keep an eye on it, just watch it and understand it. And, and if I, the more I can play with it, the better I can sort of anticipate what's coming and what the next thing is. Um, and, and try and keep, you know, some responsible guardrails on it because the problem with social media is the algorithmic aim at Mm -hmm. profit. Yeah erase it like just undermines kids well-being or in adult well-being as well and it's such a you know the incentive structure is aimed you know like a gun to your head i mean it's just it's a terrible terrible incentive structure and it just runs Mm -hmm. Uh, and that isn't even about the technology so much as it is about um something that people don't really see and understand um uh and yeah we're we're going to have lots and lots of problems and lots of issues coming out of this stuff without a doubt i've been rereading a book um by from called escape from freedom hmm. which is a wonderful book written by an old uh, freudian analyst right and uh and all of the wonderful technology that we are exposed to, including artificial intelligence, but the automation of innumerable things, the incredible seduction to, to give up our own ability to engage something, to think through something, to make our own choices, even if they're wildly idiosyncratic mm-hmm. about any number of things, that there is an incredible seduction to want to have someone, something else, someone else do it. You know, it goes to that fantasy that if I won the lottery and I had a billion dollars, 
I wouldn't even bathe myself. I'd have people feeding me on grapes with their own hand. Mm-hmm. And the fantasy is, well, that I would, I would literally like be a baby. That, that's the ultimate fantasy is that I'd just kind of loll around. Have people rub my feet all day. Um, which is incredibly seductive. Yeah, I saw you uh, yeah, smile, like, Lisa. That, that, that's, that's that could nice. work. Robots that rub your feet, that's, that's, it'll be a fleet of them. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> With a, the automatic driving cars, you'll push your buttons, it'll drive up to the front of your door, and you'll just hop in. Um, but, but that is really the existential piece of it. That is the deep, deep, deep mm-hmm. piece of all of technology is um, when we yield to something that's going to do it for us, fill in the blank, um, what does that do to the human psyche? Um, And of course, there's great benefit. I mean, look at all the machines, the cotton gin for that matter. You know, these machines have, have taken some onerous tasks out of human beings' hands. But now we're in a really different place where there's the possibility that we can program machines to tell us what to eat, uh, tell us how to cook everything. Right now, people are wanting AI to take all the technology they can and tell them exactly how to exercise so they'll get optimal results. So this idea of giving, giving away choicefulness because we're sure that the other is going to be a wiser mm. than we are and give us something better than we could imagine for ourselves. And that's um, that idea of optimization yeah. is, I think, in many ways behind this. And the idea of optimization is exclusively in the realm of ego. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. That there are enormous suboptimal decisions that we have made in our own lives, we don't even have to look into antiquity, suboptimal decisions that redirected the course of our lives in such a way that we could actually become who we really are. Yeah, I yeah, see, yeah, yeah. I see, I see. The right way to wholeness is full of faithful detours and wrong turns. That's right. Right, we have you know, to, I yeah. put all the data into the AI, and I, I should be an accountant, or I... You know, this is the exact way to do this, that, or something else, and it all makes very logical sense. And yet, you know, it was failing, failing mm-hmm. that test in uh, accounting school that made you go, damn it, I guess I'm going to have to go and be an artist instead, and then you <laughs> became a sculptor. But that's really what you wanted yeah, yeah, the no. whole time. Yes. But if you had optimized what your ego had decided to do at 18, you may never have made that fateful mm-hmm. error Yep. which liberated you from the wrong direction and forced you to have to consider something else that um, your ego would not have chosen otherwise. The fateful mistakes that we're That's, going to be yeah. in, removing from life and the fantasy that that's going to make it really great. So we're, we are in the realm of uh, the, the myth of Prometheus. And kind of this incredible technological ability to do these things that we're we're only probably just beginning to even imagine. And what does that mean? You know, Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to humans. And it was supposed to just belong to the gods. Mm-hmm. And it seems like with AI, it's another it's another thing that we're taking from the gods and giving to humans. And that can have some incredibly positive effects but it can also be quite destructive always, always these things are. Um, you know, I, I, I want to share because it seems relevant that I recently had a dream that I think is related to this. I'm not going to share the whole dream, but I'll share an image from the dream. The image was that there was a colony on the moon. There was a lunar colony. And it was all very, very exciting. But I was thinking, about, I was trying to understand that image. And of course, A colony on the moon would be entirely dependent on the Earth to provision it, and it would be kind of sterile. And uh, and it 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 also it really is this image of like so much that's kind of out there that isn't really kind of literally grounded in the Earth. And I I think the dream possibly after sitting with it and working with it um, 
actually relates to the dream book that jo Joseph, Deb, and I have been writing because one of the things that we've done, I think, I think we've done this, and I'm both excited and maybe a little bit trepidatious about it as well, is really created a protocol for working with your dreams to the extent that um, it, it it may it may have. Um, What's what's the word I'm looking for? It may have kind of it might have taken the mystery out of it a little bit. So I think it will be very effective at helping people work with their own dreams, but it also may have demystified it a bit too much. It might be, or or maybe that's the that's the fear that I have in the dream. There was a kind of compensatory image of a talking rat that um, that was I think uh, hopeful, but. But, you know, there, there is this sense, it's like, wow, you know, if you, if you, uh, like, we would never want to, um, and of course, Jung says we can't, but, you know, Jung says you can't empty the unconscious, but could AI empty the unconscious? Oh, boy. You know? Yeah, I, I, I really doubt that. I, I, I well, I don't know. I, I, I have great faith in the, the. Um, the, the ability of the unconscious, particularly the collective unconscious, to come up and grab us by the nape of the neck when we're not looking and shake everything. And how I, 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 I the Joseph, your your idea of we, we lose the fateful mistakes. Boy, I think I I would never underestimate the psyche and and the collective unconscious ability to go and say, oh yeah, you guys think. You know, you, you know what's going on. I mean, this is Sorcerer's Apprentice stuff. You know, yes. Like, watch. Yes. <laughs> watch yes. what we, we, we'll give you some faithful mistakes. Right, but, but it's Jurassic then it's Park. so destructive, yeah. right? True. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it could be. If it, 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 you know, to your point that if we just go forward saying, yes, optimize, yes, more, yes, this, yes, yes, that, that it's going to come and say, uh, no, all right, now you get Jurassic Park. Now you get, you know. There's that famous uh, interviewing quote from Jung. I think it was a Good Housekeeping magazine or something he was being interviewed by. And he says, God is the name by which I designate all things which cross my path violently and recklessly, all things which alter my plans and intentions and change the course of my life for better or for worse. That was Good Housekeeping. I adore wow. that one. <laughs> That's yeah, a great I, one, yes. My favorite. I mean, yeah. like, and how, how hard we're working to make sure that never happens. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. And yeah. I get that. I mean, who wants violent interruptions to one life? Mm -hmm. But it goes to what you were saying, John, is, well, we thwart the unconscious by optimizing and having this wonderful logical algorithms, you know, inform us in multiple fantastical ways. And how might the unconscious or the God within the unconscious mm -hmm take hold of us to violently disrupt that because it becomes more and more difficult to reach us. Yes. To, to what lengths yes. might the unconscious go yeah, to, absolutely. to reclaim its place? Um, that's sobering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the, 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 there's a bit of irony in that, in that, you know, I tend to look to my dreams to try and figure out the ways in which my unconscious is trying to slap me around or adjust me. Mm -hmm. or, right. Oh, no, you're going the wrong way. You're being goofy in this way or that way. Um, <laughs> but then you apply, you know, an AI in there to try mm -hmm. and further optimize the understanding of those exactly. dreams. Exactly. Exactly. And the symbols and so forth. And so in what way will that? So, <laughs> it's a wild experiment. It is. Mm -hmm. And I applaud you for conducting the experiment because <laughs> I think, I mean, truly, life is about experimentation. It is the human venture. Eat this, see what happens. Farm <laughs> that, see what happens. Build this, see what happens. Uh, yeah. and, and sometimes great things happen and sometimes mm -hmm. uh, it's tough. But I, I very much like that spirit of experimentation that is alive and well in you. <laughs> Thank you. My, uh, my, my analyst, when I undertook this, kept telling me, like, 
this it's impossible. You can't do this is impossible what you're trying to do. You should do it anyway, but it's impossible. <laughs> and he's been an analyst for 50 years. I'm like, and the more I do it, the more I realize hey, he's probably right, but eh, do it anyway. See what happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to bring up a couple ways that I think that at least right now, um, uh, it, it's different working with an analyst versus working with an AI in terms of dream oh, interpretation. Sure. So, so one of the one of the ways is that you know, and talking about the healing moment when you're talking about a dream with an analyst, one of the things that happens when you discuss a dream and an analysis is, you know, for I might say, well, this reminds me of this, and this reminds me that the real work that I'm doing is making connections between what the dream is saying and what I know about that person's psyche. So it's like you have a ten, you know, this is your people pleasing tendency. You tend, you know, the dream really shows that you're doing this again in this other context, you're giving something away and I can tie it back to the person's childhood and I can tie it to other dreams and I can tie it to tie it to their life situation right now. And so it's it's the way that when you work with dreams and analysis, it's very different, obviously, than what we do in the podcast because it's deeply tied in with um, your your psyche, your current situation, but also just your general psychic situation and and how profound that can be. The other thing is that um, you know there's something about and I, and I don't think this happens on Zoom in the same way. So I, I prefer to work in person. Um, you know, there's when you're sitting in the room with someone, there is a field that develops and neurobiology. I mean, we think of it as a field because that's how it feels. But neurobiology is, you know, confirming that something is happening between my nervous system and the nervous system of the person sitting across from me, at least some of the times, you know. And there can be this, uh, this place where we reach kind of co-regulation. And that's the unconscious to unconscious connection, I think, or it's related to that, that Jung talked about. And so when you're talking, you know, I've had sessions both being the analyst and being the analysand where we're talking about a dream and it's like the, the air is shimmering, you know, I mean, metaphorically, but it feels, it feels really different. It feels different in my body, uh, you know, and it's like, it's like something really moved. And I don't, I don't, I doubt, I, <laughs> I don't think an AI will ever be able to do that. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, of course not. I, I mean, um, you know, and, and we need to differentiate between what AI is doing now and what AI will do. And we're yes. really talking about an anticipation of what it might do. Yes. Uh, which yes. is the right way to think about it because it's moving so quickly. Really fast. You, you really can't take comfort in what it's unable to do right now. That's right. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with that completely. The, the, yeah, it, the, the other side of it too is that, the, and this is kind of that soul to soul thing as well. Um, but but it, th there are there are things that occur in the intellect, and there is sort of knowledge transfer. That you you know you, I'm sure you've had pay clients that you can work with, and you can tell them a hundred times. Hey, you're doing this again. This is what's happening. You could explain their complexes, their this and that, and like and, and lay it all out for them. But that doesn't change them. That doesn't yeah. heal them. You know, I, I think the AI could become very useful in the sense of being very good at quickly analyzing this and that and that and that and that. And then you've got a piece of paper that says, okay, all these things. Mm. But you could give me that paper about me. And it wouldn't change me. <laughs> like, I'd, be like, I'd be like, oh, well, okay, maybe I should think about that a little more. But it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the difference between an intellectual understanding something and, and like a felt understanding of something, which seems to come from between people. And in my experience of analysis, that that's the thing that, and this is because I'm, I'm also like what you'd call a thinking type. Like I'm always trying to be like, okay, because I, I, if I keep thinking, it doesn't actually get me anywhere. I just go further in my imbalance towards thinking. Um, you know, but, but, you know, analysis to me seems so fundamentally about 
uh, reworking of my unconscious relationship to another person. Yeah. In kind of new ways. And I don't think AI is ever going to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So inter the AI is never going to be able to interpret the transference. Right. Yeah, yeah. Not at all. I think that's probably true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it is fundamentally an interpersonal experience. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing that I also hope people will take from our conversation is they shouldn't ignore this. That, um, that all of us have to figure out our individual relationships to things like artificial intelligence and apps and devices, and that pretending they don't exist, taking a kind of Luddite attitude, is, is going to leave you at a gross disadvantage and in some ways make you more vulnerable to the technology because as it integrates into our daily lives, you won't be able to track it and you won't understand mm -hmm. its possible influence. So whether or not we like it or we're scared of it or we're thrilled by it or we have enormous dark or light fantasies, we have to put our hands on it and play with the dials and learn something about it so then we can have an educated opinion about it. And we're not just depending on some kind of TikTok child telling you what to think about mm -hmm. something. So we need to conduct our own experiments, which are very much available right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think in, in, in particular to drill in on something that you said, Joseph, uh, about influence, I, in my, my, my fears about AI are fundamentally about its ability to influence us. Mm -hmm. um, and the only way to counter that is serious attention, conscious attention to yourself and the way that you're feeling and responding to all of these things that are starting to come and increasingly coming. I mean, it's sort of social media. They, we, we, we click and we click and we click, and it's an algorithm that's read all the other things that I've clicked, so it knows mm -hmm. what I like, knows what I react to, knows what I don't like, and it's trying to get me to respond all the time. AI is going to take that up a hundred notches, right? and it's going to be incredibly important to try and be aware of that, so keep some consciousness of that influence and the way we're being influenced and i think you're right that, that that's that's the game as it comes is to really watch it carefully reality is medicinal and so we have to yeah. face it and find it over yeah. and over again yeah. and that we are healthier in all dimensions when we move towards as much as we can know what is real mm -hmm. um you know, I think to maybe paraphrase what you both have just been saying is, you know, the inner world is sacred and it's a rich kind of ecosystem. And what's frightening is to think about inviting uh, tech, I guess, into the inner world and letting it kind of, you know, mine the inner world and exploit the inner world for profit the same way that we've mined and exploited the you know, outer ecosystem. So there's also been this, I think, like absolutely terrifying <laughs> technology where uh, apparently you can, I don't know, hook electrodes up to someone's brain and then see their dream where you can, you know, the, the, the computer is able to read the brain activity and know that you were dreaming about a giraffe. And and so, you know, the, the sanctity of the inner world is on the threshold of being violated. I, I have a couple thoughts about that. On, on the one hand, I was a little, um, not relieved, but a little reassured in the sense that, oh, good, now that's a good answer to all those people who say dreams are just you're staring at a staticky television set and making stuff up. Like that, that's, that's, it's yeah. a little bit like, you yeah, know, um, word association experiment, experiment. Hey, this is actual proof of 
you know, of the unconscious and its influence. Mm -hmm. so yeah. This is proof that dreams are real. So yep. that's kind of the upside that, yeah. And really, we're looking at a giraffe. Right. Exactly. Like yeah. you're, we saw, yeah, here's yeah. what your dream report is. And we saw that you were looking at a draft too. It is pretty terrifying to imagine that that's basically mind reading. Yes. Uh, you know, it's not basically, it's explicitly mind reading. Um, on the other hand, it doesn't, just because they can come up with the images that your brain is coming up with, doesn't mean they know what it means. You know, it doesn't, doesn't mean they're going to understand what that, you know, you, you, you still have to have, you know, a real interpretation of the dream. Um, uh, I suppose you then hook it to it. I mean, you can go, you can go dark fast. <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Really fast. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty, I mean, and it's somewhat fun to imagine. It's the stuff of, you know, great yeah. sci-fi, but it, it, it also is a little frightening. I'm thinking of, you know, one of my favorite books that I mention all the time on the podcast is The Master and His Emissary by Ian McKilchrist. And, you know, that the title of the book comes from, I think it's a story from Nietzsche where, uh, you know, and, and, and it, you know, McGilchrist says the, the emissary has the emissary is meant to serve the master, but what's happened is the the emissary has betrayed the master. And he talks about um, the right hemisphere versus the left hemisphere, and the 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 sorry, the right hemisphere is the master supposed to be served by the left hemisphere, but it's kind of gotten flipped. Uh, um, Einstein said something extraordinarily similar about the rational mind and the uh, imagination saying almost the same thing. And it, it seems to me that um, if we say that the dream maker is the master mm -hmm. and tech is the emissary, we need to make sure that the master doesn't get betrayed and that this is all in service to the dream maker or AKA in my book anyway, the self and that this is serving the agenda of the self. Yeah. I I would definitely agree. I mean, it, it reminds me of the the Auden quote: "We are lived by powers we pretend to understand." You know, it, it's that same I love thing. That we, we can, you know, but, but although Auden's perspective is a little different in that it's he, he's a little bit more like we're the master is really in charge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, whereas, you could you could imagine sorry, that both ways. Right. Right, um, the, the McGilchrist is saying, no, 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 don't, don't, don't get this mixed up. Um, uh, yeah, I, the, it's an absolute true warning and something we need to pay attention to. So maybe it's time for us to transition into a dream. Yeah. Today's dreamer is a 38-year-old female who is early in her career as a therapist, and she titles this dream, The Map and Currency. I'm in a big open space that feels like a tented shelter, and there are benches for sitting in a sort of circle. I'm talking to someone who seems to know me from when I was in an MFA creative writing program. He says, Yes, we were in the same class with Professor something or other. In his course about dreams, he loved you. You were his favorite. I'm surprised and a little doubtful because I don't remember the class at all, though I try to remember and think I might be remembering it. Then I notice there is a group of people sitting farther away all wearing the same clothes, and I realize they're in a cult. It doesn't alarm me. An older woman walks up to me and she asks for me to pay my entrance fee. I pull out a colorful pouch and I apologize for only having foreign currency, which seems silly. I hand her coins and she doesn't seem to be too worried. I pull out a colorful bill and when she takes it, it unfolds into an old world map. She points to the ocean on the map and reads to me poems that I wrote. They're small and beautiful and joyful. I feel moved and surprised. I find a nickel and quarter and give it to her. 
She says, Well, that's a K-hole lift, now isn't it? Then I woke up. For context, she writes, I've been experiencing what feels like a big positive transformation. It's included an increase in energy, confidence, and excitement for the future. Her main feelings in the dream were confusion, caution, curiosity, and surprise. And then a few of her associations are, I associate the tent with a revival and the older woman as an inner guide. I associate the professor with intellect and success. The map felt like my mind, and the ocean felt like hidden depths. So I had to look up K hole. <laughs> did you did you know what that was? Uh, I don't, but please enlighten us. Okay, this is what uh, this is what this is what AI says. No, um, this is what the <laughs> internet says. It's slang for experiences related to ketamine or the effects of ketamine. K hole refers to the out of body near death experience. Ah, okay. Yeah, ketamine induces dose-related effects that include distortion of time and space, hallucinations, and mild dissociative shifts. During K-hole, users experience an enhanced detachment from the environment, resulting in an inability to respond to surroundings and move their bodies functionally. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. Didn't know any of that. Um, So, I mean, okay. Overall, this is a positive dream with um, positive exper- with positive emotions, especially toward the end. Mm-hmm. The dream seems to be uh, the dream maker seems to be kind of uh, um, affirming that the dreamer is on the right path. Um, there was there was a lot of really interesting imagery in it. I I. I mean, a lot, but just a couple of things. I thought it was interesting to pay the entrance fee, which points to this sort of moment of transformation or initiation. You know, it's not, transformation is not free. Mm-hmm. You, have to, you have to pay to, uh, to, to be transformed. Um, so she, there's an entrance fee. And it's interesting that it's, um, the, the currency is foreign. This is, this is, Foreign to ego consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it is far away from ego. Um, So I'll I'll just, I'll toss it back to you, Joseph. But those were a couple of the first things that I looked at. I'm assuming when she says, I pull out a colorful bill, that she means a currency. Um, Yeah, I got that too. So I feel a little more suspicious of the dream. Okay. And I'm wondering if it is something that's trickier. Because in the end, based on what you learned about the idea of K-hole, she seems to be suggesting that all of this fantastical feeling could just be like a drug-induced phantasmagoria. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's interesting, yeah. And when I think about my early life as a therapist in the beginning, it can be slightly inf- Leading and euphoric. Mm-hmm. I mean, people come to you, they, they trust you immediately, they just close mm-hmm. things, maybe they have remarkable emotional releases, and as a new therapist, that seems incredibly exciting, inflating, euphoric. So I'm wondering if um, the cautionary note is that <laughs> there's a, a little too much shine, a little too much in the big positive transformation that could Mm -hmm. be a bit of that golden child syndrome. And and the gentle inference there at the end is, um, you're going to come down from this trip. Yeah. (laughs) And then therapy is going to just be hard work. Right. And... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and 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 that that I think I, I like I like what she said, and I think uh, you know the fact that she gives her a nickel and a quarter, and it's like oh thirty cents, you know, it's like oh okay, you know that's all it's worth. It, it there there's there's a there is a little bit of that uh, that the old the old woman's like yeah, this is you're gonna come back down to earth. Um, I I thought 
I thought it was interesting. Um, I, I'd be so curious about the the guy. I if it, if this is a real person, um, the the person who who seems to know me from when I was in the M- MFA creative writing program. I'd be curious if that w- was a real person, and also mm-hmm. was there a real professor? Um, it, the the dream seems to reference this MFA program. I'm making up that she wrote poetry in the MFA mm-hmm. program, or, or assuming that. Um, but some somehow the the MFA program had a course in in the dream anyway about dreams. Um, mm-hmm. So so there's some there's some kind of reaching back. I'm assuming she also has a master's degree now in mental health, presumably, um, or or has studied it in some in, to some extent. Uh, but but the dream is really pointing back to this time when she was uh, in the creative writing program, mm-hmm. and that she was loved and favored, mm-hmm. but she can't quite remember it, which is I think good because there's a, perhaps a, an aggrandized yeah um, declaration there, and something in the ego goes, wait a minute, I'm not a, totally sure about this, although it'd be easy to get swept up in all of that. The idea that there's an, a creative writing program, mm-hmm. that, that could be also an inference that she is creatively writing a narrative in her life at the moment that is just very luminous and lovely and colorful and, and that may or may not be well-oriented to reality. But it doesn't mean it's a terrible thing. Well, what comes up for me around your very good point, I think, about inflation is that we need a little inflation when we start off on a new journey. Right. So, you know, when I remember the first, you know, Jungian seminar I went to, I was like, you know, the, the clouds parted and I floated home. And, you know, to, you know, five years later, it's like, oh, God, you know, I've got to write this case up, you know, and it, it wasn't it wasn't so magical anymore. But it it's it is important sometimes for things to feel very magical and luminous in the beginning and and uh this this may be kind of where she is and there's this colorful pouch and this colorful bill and um you know, you know and and so so it, i think it's a both and both that yeah the shine's going to come off this a little bit mm-hmm. um but uh but then but then there's something real here there really is a a, a wonderful kind of ocean uh, and, a, and, a, and a map that shows this um, this this beautiful world and uh, mm-hmm. and and this this currency that is now foreign to you but may not always be so. And, and I think the medicine in the dream is gentle. Mm-hmm. Um, that the dream ego thinks, oh, I'm a little surprised. I'm a little doubtful. This seems a little silly. And and that's probably how we should um, orient to an inflation when we discover it. It's okay. It's I'm just being a little bit silly. I should probably just be a little doubtful of, about how bright and shiny everything is. But we don't want to attack the inflation. But we can be good natured towards it. Well, she doesn't just feel silly though. She says, "I feel moved," and that well, to me mm-hmm. is uh, important because I think that's 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 where there is something real at the kernel of this. Mm-hmm. And then she gives the old woman a nickel and a quarter, and the old woman kind of makes this comment that, you know, I think you're right, could sort of be seen as a little bit cautionary or dismissive or something like that. Well, I was picking up some of the descriptive words that are scattered yeah. throughout yes. that way. Yes. But I agree with you. It's not that it isn't meaningful, and the medicine is just, it's just a little, let, let's just cool it off a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's not crush it. Yeah, yeah. There's like you don't want you don't want your teenage kid yeah. to not feel confident, but you also don't want them to be six feet off the ground. Right. You know, there has to be like a middle space of feeling good but not unrealistic. And so, mm-hmm. Joseph, what what are your thoughts? I mean, so there's the tented shelter, which she associated with revival, mm-hmm. and then there's this this cult. <laughs> <laughs> the cult of being a therapist was my first <laughs> thought. <laughs> you know, that we were all wearing white clothes, yeah. you know, when no one's looking, you know, at our conferences. <laughs> but and she's being asked to join this um, select group mm-hmm. of people that um, surround a particular idea or a leader. And that's a school of, of 
therapy. Maybe Carl Rogers is at the center of the cult of Freud or Jung or hmm. Skinner or something like that. So being invited into that, I also think that, you know, white is the albedo. So there's something Wait, about... She say, are, are they wearing white? It yeah. says they're all wearing the same clothes. Oh, then, I, isn't that funny? I, did, I made it into white clothes, uh. so I need to take that out. That was an intrusion. Okay. But there is something about a similarity. Yeah, they're all wearing... Between them. Yeah, and, and, and again, I think that could... We could understand that, um, you know, according to your thesis, that this is... There's a little warning, you know, that it, that it can be so seductive to enter a new field and just mm-hmm. want to adopt all of the beliefs that that everyone has and just well you know you have to be careful that you don't uh uh tip over into a place where where your your own judgment just goes away you know and i think that that can happen to us when we're kind of in a new place experiencing something new we set aside our judgment and can find ourselves kind of going off down a path that's like, well, wait a minute, that, that, that doesn't agree with me. And um, part of that, I think, is the revival tent. I love yeah. the idea of evangelizing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this Jungian life, we are like Jungian evangelists. <laughs> you know, and it's just true. You know, you yeah. fall in love with something and you're like waving the red book around yeah. like it's a Bible, yeah. you yeah. know, <laughs> asking people to come up to the altar call and Submit a dream or something oh, like that. God. So, no, I mean, it's, no. I mean, I get it totally. <laughs> guilty, guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. <laughs> you know, so like I feel really sympathetic to all of these. I totally relate to the uh, this kind of swell of feeling we get caught up in. Yeah, well, uh, one of our colleagues, <laughs> she likes to joke that, uh, you know, when your family hears you talk about Jungian training, they want to hire a, you know, a cult in- interventionist, a deep <laughs> yeah, deep yeah exactly. <laughs> so. so it's good that she has energy. It's good yeah. she's starting with something new. It's good she feels good, and it's good there's a little tiny bit of of doubt mm-hmm. uh, around it. Not squelching, just like a little teaspoon of well, yeah. maybe I should keep a tiny critical yeah. analysis of these things. So, John. What did the AI think of this dream? All right. So I'm Let's so curious. I know. This is going to be, this will be about as entertaining as watching Michael Jordan play some grade schooler. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I, don't know. I don't know about that. Boy, I, I just want to say that is the first time ever in my life I have been analogized to Michael Jordan. So, <laughs> and probably the last. <laughs> <laughs> well, excellent. Uh, Let's see. So what I did is I, I took the dream as exactly as you guys have it and all the details about the person and the context and the feeling tone and the associations. And I put that in a Temino stream and asked it for an AI interpretation. And I also asked it for myths and legends related to it. Mm-hmm. So we can take a look at that after. And we also created a couple pictures, uh, images from the dream just for entertainment sake. Uh, but so to start off with, we'll take a look at the interpretation and I haven't read this before either because we just did it, uh, did this, but, uh, here it is. Uh, the dream opens in a tent like shelter, a space symbolizing temporary accommodation and transition closely, closely aligning with your current feelings of undergoing transformation, adaptability, and venturing into unknown territories. This space reminiscent of a revival suggests a reawakening or renewal of the self. The circle of benches where interaction occurs can be interpreted as a symbol of your current contemplative state, pausing pausing to reflect during this period of transition. The circular arrangement may also indicate a drive toward unity and wholeness, emphasizing the interconnectedness of all aspects of life and your own psyche. Engagement with a past peer and a professor from your MFA program in the dream highlights themes of learning and development, but also of forgotten or unacknowledged aspects of self, as you don't recall the specific class mentioned. The professor, a figure of knowledge and authority, might symbolize guidance or could be manifesting an aspect of your own inner wisdom as you navigate through this critical transformation. The presence of a cult though unalarming in the dream, might represent a strong pull toward a specific belief system or ideology, 
possibly indicating parts of your professional or personal life where conformity and acceptance are influential. It's important here to consider what aspects of your life feel similarly absorbing or potentially overshadowing of individual thought. The engagement with the older woman, who appears as an inner guide demanding an entrance fee, can suggest a psychic cost associated with accessing new areas of personal growth. The act of paying with foreign currency, colorful and unfamiliar, points to your current state striving for adaptability in the face of new experiences outside of your comfort zone. The unfolding bill into a world map signifies an expansive perspective opening up to you, a symbolic representation of your expanding mental and emotional horizons. Her reading of your poetry from the map, a poignant moment of reconnection to your small, joyful creations, further emphasizes the rediscovery and acknowledgement of aspects of your individ- uh, sorry of aspects of your identity and capabilities that you might not be fully appreciating in your waking life. The final verbal exchange involving a K-hole lift with the coins brings attention to the interaction between minor yet significant shifts in perception or value, symbolized by the nickel and the quarter, and the broader transformative journey you are undertaking. This suggests a delicate play between small personal realizations and their impacts on your overall overarching path. Questions for deeper reflection may include, what aspects of your past self mirrored by the classmate and professor are you being called to integrate or acknowledge as you grow? In what areas of life might you be conforming too readily to the ideas of and beliefs of others as suggested by the presence of the cult? How might the seemingly minor but significant parts of self suggested by the coins and colorful pouch be contributing to your current transformation and future goals? Each symbol and interaction in your dream hints at an underlying narrative of rediscovery, adjustment, and the integration of past and present as you navigate this vivid transformation. Is there a balance you need to strike between welcoming new influences and staying true to your authentic self? And how can, you, how can your rediscovered inner resources empower this journey? These thoughts about your dream have been informed by hundreds of books on dream work and thousands of curated symbols to help you gain insight into yourself and your unconscious. But I am only an AI. <laughs> about anything that doesn't resonate with you and keep only those ideas that feel right. The deepest dream work begins when you be- bring a dream into a human relationship. Carl Jung said, growth, transformation, and healing ultimately come from relationship. Alone with a phone is not enough. Choose carefully. <laughs> Consider sharing a dream or two with a trusted friend. It's a remarkable way to get to know someone better and yourself. We hope this interpretation gave you at least one new idea to explore. Dream often and dream well. <laughs> oh, that's, that's very yeah. sweet. And did it offer up any uh, myths or fairy tales? Yeah, it. Uh, let's see what um, it offered a whole set, and uh, there were a couple that um, that looked like they might be particularly interesting. Um, one was the Fisher King. This legend deals with the quest for a holy grail, which is a search for deep personal truth and healing reflecting the dreamer's journey towards inner joy and, con- and contentment as expressed through their own poetry. Uh, and then it goes on to explain more. The Fisher King is a figure in Arthurian legend who is the guardian of the Holy Grail. He is wounded both physically and spiritually, and his health is directly tied to the fertility of his land, which lies barren as a result of his suffering. The Fisher King's realm will only be restored to prosperity when a noble knight successfully quests for the grail, which can heal the king and thus restore the land. This story is rich in themes of healing, the quest for a significant and transformative object, and the connection between the leader's well-being and the well-being of his domain. In relation to the dream, the Fisher King myth is relevant in several ways. The quest for healing and transformation, just as the Fisher King awaits healing through the quest for the Holy Grail, the dreamer is experiencing a personal transformation and growth 
symbolized by the dream's themes of self-discovery and renewal, positive transformation mentioned by the dreamer. And then it actually goes on for a number of other things. But uh, it gives you a little bit of a sense of it. It uh, also mentions the alchemist, tale of tra transformation and finding one's true path, echoes the, the dreamer's current life, phase of positive transformation and self-discovery. So it's talking about the alchemist, the novel by Paul mm -hmm. Coelho. Yeah. Um, uh, but I could go on and on and on because yeah, it's yeah. lots and lots of stuff. Right. Um, so it uh, seems like the AI has taken things like the Fisher King and then categorized it in a number of ways. For instance, as you were saying, there's the thematic that it comes up in themes of healing. And so it might then be applied to other people's dreams who seem to have themes of healing. Yeah. Okay. And then it, it will also look at particular symbols um, uh, in dreams. A, a, a friend had a dream that referenced um, uh, an old friend's boyfriend whose name was David, and she couldn't figure out. It was 12 years since she knew him, and then it pulled out David and Goliath, and it turned out David and Goliath had a very strong represent, you know, relationship to the dream. Mm -hmm. So it, it'll, it'll go either for themes or for symbols, mm -hmm. um, and it misses a lot. But every now and then it comes up with a really nice one. That, but, that yeah, alone is such a boon yeah. because um, very few uh, of, uh, for instance, our dream school students have time to, to research all the possible amplifications. So that's a gem, yeah, uh, that's undoubtedly. Great. I, I thought it did I thought it did pretty well. You know, it, it I was thinking my wheels were turning while I was listening to your mm -hmm. interpretation. I mean, I, I think, you know, when I think of like a the mythology mythological level of the stream, one of the things and we could go further with this, but uh, you know, mm -hmm. that the the old woman is sort of the um the guardian at the threshold, you know, mm. that when you're gonna pass to a new stage of development there's a lot that's a kind of mythological figure it's a like a motif that that there's some threshold that you have to pass and you must usually pass a trial in this case she has to pay and that's where the foreign currency comes in and and in 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 a way it become it comes after the cult mm -hmm. you know that so that's when the more individual part of the journey starts is she has to pay her entrance fee um it's interesting because the ai had a more or less pretty pretty close uh take on the cult than I think that you and I had, Joseph. That seemed uh pretty pretty uh it seems like we all agreed on that, you know. But so fascinating. What a what a cool experiment we just ran. I found it mm -hmm. I found it really interesting as well. I, I really liked the way the AI took a symbol and then in a sense, was brought out the dominance of it. You know, sitting in a circle could be like this, or people yep. sit in circles for these reasons. And I thought um, those generalities, I think, are very important because they speak to more of the collective understanding of these things. Um, and, and it takes a little bit out of the personal, which I kind of like, because if the dream stays too much in the personal associations, then sometimes we, uh, we miss um, how the dream is pushing us, and it feels a little too just confirming. So, yeah, I really I appreciated the way it broke down each of the ideas. So that's that's a cool new dream partner. Yeah, it's you know for five minutes it's a pretty good little you know, little attempt and mm -hmm. you know provocative. Mm -hmm. Well. Um, John, we really appreciate you joining us today, and uh, we will have uh, more information in the show notes about uh, about Temenos and where you can find it and and how you can sign up. Terrific! I've really enjoyed being here. Thank you very much. It was a real privilege. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. 
and keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.